So one approach to doing that and to dealing with the complexities of, of tropical world, which in, involve limiting infrastructures and e economic structures, is to develop a consortium approach specifically to get new technology out the door. If you look at how new technology is developed, it's very, very rare that we have a quantal breakthrough like PCR, which is then capitalized in a strategic way. Usually, it's incremental improvements. Everybody tries this, they try that, they try that. And you end up with this, this Rube Goldberg apparatus based on a, on a clean and simple observation. What we need to do is do this strategically now for the next generation of technologies. And so what I'm proposing is that we develop a, a consortium approach to develop novel instrumentation and methods that allow decentralized, it's very important, high throughput indexing of plants and other biota worldwide. Worldwide is very important. And you'll see from the next slide, our assertion is that since the vast majority of the world's biodiversity is located in tropical countries of the developing world, these are the people who have stewardship capabilities of that. They should be the people who are empowered to measure and to use that wisely. We've been beneficiaries of that. Uh, almost all of American agriculture is imported. I just used this line a little earlier today to some people from the press, but basically 99.8 or 9% of American uh, agriculture came from the third world. Uh, wheat came from the Middle East, uh, soybeans from China, maize from Mexico and Central America. And the comment is that if we made our songs based on North American traditions, we'd be looking from sea to shining sea at amber waves of cranberries. And uh, that just doesn't make for the sort of snappy tunes. Um, so the point is, we've already used our germplasm. How can we now make an equitable system by which they can characterize and preserve and use wisely their own germplasm and make it available to us to enhance the diversity of our own agricultures. So we have to set criteria for the development. If we want to do something strategically for a change instead of ad hoc, we set the criteria early on, bring in the right players as early as we can, uh, squeal for money with the Global Environment Facility, I'll come to that, and do the job. So we have to initially say that our technology has to be obviously robust, extremely inexpensive. Now these two are really tough ones. We need high throughput that is probably three or four orders of magnitude higher than what we have now, uh, and it has to be comparably uh, inexpensive, meaning three or four orders of magnitude lower in price. If you think about agriculture, one of the problems is each sample you measure has almost no intrinsic value. Unlike medicine, where one good analysis will tell you if you're a carrier or not, or if you have a disease or not. In agriculture, you may have to do 10,000 analyses to get a good picture of what's going on. And the value of the judgment, of the management decision made on the basis of that information is correspondingly low. Therefore, there's not much money in it. So if we want to see sustainable agriculture and improvements in the environment, we're going to have to address the fact that we're not going to have a big economic engine to do it. It has to be totally unambiguous and legally accountable, and that's very important. And it has to be used for numerous taxonomic groups, or we're going to find ourselves basically inventing a useless dead-end technology. And this is really a, a good timing for this type of technology because we're now getting geographical positioning systems that are very, very comprehensive. And the idea of integrating collection devices that ensure that every DNA sample that is fingerprinted by whatever technology emerges is a time and a space uh, that that sample originally existed in. It can be very powerful. So how do we do this? Well, we first set what are the outputs. We need general methods for preparation of high quality template DNA uh, from diverse biota. And that's going to include arthropods, fungi, most importantly, in the first case, plants. We need to make genetic maps of test plants and arthropod species, largely to prove principle of the approach. Sequence-derived taxonomic data is going to be very important, and fingerprints are very important. But in speciation, genetic maps matter a lot. A simple trans translocation or, or inversion can be a meiotic block that will functionally be a barrier for speciation. And if we don't actually see these, we're not going to learn the information we need. Okay, we need to identify the technical bottlenecks in analysis, collection, and vouchering. This concept is very important to get across. If you analyze a sample, either agriculturally or in terms of environment, you've got to save it. You've got to save a piece of that. And, and the museology, the, the vouchering, is going to be one of the biggest bottlenecks and one that's least accessible to the molecular biologist. How do we save a sample of, of one of these 50,000, 60,000 rice accessions we analyze? How do we save it of a vegetatively propagated crop? It's going to be very difficult. We need to make tangible improvements uh, an instrument designed by working with private sector firms. And uh, database is going to be a big challenge, but luckily we can write on the backs of a lot of good work going on already. Um, key issue here is we have to increase the infrastructure and scientific capability of the developing country participants in this consortium. Um, we also need to ensure that from the beginning we start policy analysis. 
When you can actually have accountable forensics of germplasm in, in the environment, there are going to be big implications for world economy and for policy. And we can't just invent it and then sort of, uh, um, after the fact, hope that we can sort of plug the holes that we start up. We really have to start analyzing what are the outcomes now. So what sort of candidate biota are we proposing? Well, cassava, taro, yam, and other roots and tubers that are important in Africa and the South Pacific are very important because they haven't got much sex and they've got a lot of problems. Hmm. Yeah, plantation species such as acacia and eucalyptus. Right now, much of the tropical rainforest is being destroyed, and one of the reasons it's being destroyed is because there isn't a viable alternative economically. Plantation uh, silviculture is extremely important, but if it's done right, can be an alternative to primary hardwood uh, harvesting. And the Australian community where I live uh, has been disseminating acacia and eucalyptus as planting material for a long time. Much of Indonesian plantation forestry is based around acacia, for instance. But we don't know enough about the diversity of the planting material. Coconut sounds sort of balmy, the idea of working on coconut. But again, close to 100 million people depend on it for survival. Coastal mangroves, certain arthropods that are of enormous importance. Brown plant hopper is the largest, uh, largest pest of rice production worldwide. Uh, and we have the ability to look at probably 10 million accessions of it from all over the world because of a, of a uh, program on integrated pest management. So who's going to be in this consortium? First of all, the most important is that the national programs in the tropical countries, in science, agriculture, and the environment, sadly, they're all separate programs in all of these countries, uh, like they are here. Uh, international intergovernmental agencies, because even though I don't like it, uh, we've got to deal with the policymakers and the, basically the politicians. Uh, we have to deal with it if we're, if we're going to see this actually affect anything. So I want to deal with intergovernmental agencies that will that'll do that for us so, so that the science can proceed without wearing suits. Uh, private sector instrumentation companies, and I've been really fortunate here to have an early interaction with Perkin Elmer because they're quite keen to see this in the 10 or 15 year time scale, to see this kind of robust instrumentation proceed. And I'd like to, to invite other members of the private sector instrumentation community to participate in the consortium as well. Our, our job, basically, is to find public subsidizing for the development of this kind of instrumentation. We don't expect any company can absorb the cost. Our job in this consortium is to find that money from the international community to subsidize that. Non-governmental organizations, obviously research institutions and universities, that's pretty clear. Now, the consortium, is, as it's being formed now, has the umbrella work with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, which is a, a traditionally large and bureaucratic organization, but which has very important links uh, in agricultural research and policy in every country in the world, pretty much. These are some of the countries that have already expressed strong interest in participation. The list is already growing since I made this slide. Um, an international non-governmental institution whose whole job is plant genetic resources uh, has also uh, signed a memorandum of understanding to participate. And a variety of other organizations um, have expressed their desire. So why is Australia the nexus? You say, oh, that's really nice, but why not Berkeley? Um, you can get cappuccino in Canberra, and it's just as good. Um, the main reason is that Australia is a, is a neutral venue. To develop a, a technology that will involve all the tropical countries, you have to find a place that's functionally like a banking Switzerland for science and agriculture. And m though you can tell from my voice I'm not Australian, the problem with the United States and the European community is that they are an enormously disruptive force in agricultural trade. And that, that minimizes their credibility amongst the developing nations that host most of the world's biodiversity. Uh, so consequently, finding a neutral but technologically advanced venue is very important. And so we set up Cambia in Australia also because we have a terrific uh, set of neighbors and hosts, including the CSIRO, several divisions are very important there, the National Botanic Gardens, which is quite a credible organization. Uh, Australian National University has some very good people in both the modeling and in the, uh, the ex-ante analysis. So we've decided to set it up there. And but the plan basically is to develop a two-phase proposal going to the Global Environment Facility at the World Bank for long-term funding. Uh, and several ministries of foreign affairs, including Scandinavian countries, have expressed a lot of interest in the first phase funding. So the idea then is to develop core labs there and in collaborating laboratories, work with private sector and international agencies to try to overcome the bottlenecks. Some of them will be boring bottlenecks, developing DNA. Others will be very interesting and exciting bottlenecks, like dealing with the whole genome question in environmental samples. I think it's a very exciting notion and certainly very ambitious. And I just want to close saying that, well, it is ambitious. The people we work with think that our aim is true. Uh, so I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>